Welcome to a new edition of Inside Grand Prix. Today, all about the next Grand Prix in Turkey. First then, close up, people and places. Picturesque atmosphere, imposing buildings, proud people. Turkey, the border country between East and West, is presenting itself to the Formula One community for a second time. Ninety-seven percent of Turkey lies in Asia. And if you journey into the country's hinterland, you can discover its special beauty. The volcanic rock of Cappadocia. The springs of Pamukkale. The hospitality of the people. On the long coastline, you can take your pick between sleepy fishing villages and major tourist centers. Everywhere has a special romance. This bridge unites Europe with Asia. Istanbul, a city that straddles the Bosphorus, shows the great dynamism of modern Turkey. Nine million people live here, anchored in their culture and yet open to the modern world. It's fantastic and very impressive about the, the city. It's a, a big city and uh, between historically and uh, modern and uh, you know I think it's a good mixture and uh, uh, I'm very impressive so far. At every turn a visibly eventful history. The Hagia Sophia with its unsurpassed dome is just one of the city's many religious sites. Impressive architecture everywhere pays witness to the past, but that is by no means all. Last year I stayed in the city itself. Turkey is certainly very interesting with all the bazaars. They're really something else. Industrious trade and peaceful relaxation hand in hand. The bazaars are meeting places and lively markets all in one. Everywhere there are things to see, smell and try. Inside the bazaar is somewhat calmer, but no less rich in variety. Turkey has once again dressed itself up to look its best for its global guests from Formula One. Coming up in Safety Focus, safety beside the track. But first, a virtual lap of the Autodrome. Located on the border of the continents of Europe and Asia, just inside the European part, we find the Autodrome, the Turkish Grand Prix circuit. Nestling in hilly countryside not far from Istanbul, it again promises to be one of the highlights of the season. They've done a great job of the circuit. It's a very, very uh, challenging track. Uh, long, long turn eight with a, with a quick left-hander with, with like a triple apex, which is very, very fast. Then a big downhill section. You have a uh, really good job they did in their first year in Turkey to uh, make the track uh, so demanding for the drivers and for the, uh, for the teams. So uh, looking forward to going back there for the second year. A special feature here, the cars run anti-clockwise. Quick left right after the start, then we're already accelerating up to 295. The wide track provides lots of room for overtaking. The drivers have up to 21 meters available for their maneuvers. For example, here as they approach turn 6 at almost 280. Then comes Neck Torture Corner, one of the circuit designer's real gems. 
The circuit's been superbly designed by Hermann Tilke. It's really great, lots of fun to drive, especially the really long left-hander where your neck totally gives up and lies all over to one side. I'm sure it'll be a great race again this year. High speed here, 270, and the corner never ends. After your neck, it's time to worry about your stomach, with the ups and downs causing a constant queasy feeling. A short, fast swerve, and then we're onto the long back straight with a slight bend to the right. Always good for high speeds of up to 320 kilometers an hour. At the end, a chance to overtake. The plan simple, break late and slip by before the chicane. Then give the curbstones another good kiss and it's back onto the home straight. Last year's winner, by the way, was Kimi Raikkonen. Currently, however, he's only fifth in the table. The one point from Hungary helps Schumacher to narrow Alonso's current lead to 10 points. In the Constructors' Championship, Ferrari are now just seven points behind leaders Renault. Next in Legends, Formula One 30 years ago. But now in personal, Alexander Wurz. At 32, finally back in the hot seat, Alexander Wurz, Formula One's eternal third man, is ending his long-term role as a test driver. In 2007, he's going after the points for Williams. For six years, the Austrian has been seen as a gifted analysis with great technical understanding. Only Formula One's elite guard had no place for him during that time. I was with Benetton Renault for three and a half years, had podium finishes, fastest laps, good races and won a lot of points. Then I decided to be a test driver, even though I had offers to race in Formula One. Unfortunately though, for teams with fairly low budgets, that's very important for me as I'd already had a bit of modest success. My situation is different. As a new driver, I would accept going to a low-budget team. However, in my situation, I know well that if you haven't got a decent car, you can't win. In my situation, I know that if you don't have the car, you can't win. Kannst du nicht gewinnen. Alexander Wurz is the only driver to have test driven for every British team during his career. Valued by engineers and mechanics and respected by fellow drivers. Wurz, the team player and hard worker, while until now others took all the glory. This experience could yet prove very valuable. It's certainly one of my strengths that I'm able to bridge the divide between drivers and engineers in the way that I can communicate with the technical guys. They can only think in facts and figures, not like a racing driver. If you understand their way of thinking, which I do because I went to technical college and have an interest in technology and engineering, then for that reason, or perhaps because of the way I communicate, I'm able to work better with them. They get better information and that reaps the rewards. Sie bekommen mehr Informationen und das fruchtet. Back in 1998, the Austrian was already impressing as Giancarlo Fisichella's partner at Benetton, even scoring more championship points than the Italian. He seemed to have made it into the driving elite. In 2002, he signed as one of the main drivers for the Silver Arrows, but Ron Dennis changed his mind at the last minute in order to put Kimi Raikkonen behind the wheel. For Wurz, it was the biggest disappointment yet in his career. At the end of 2005, after five years with McLaren Mercedes, he left and signed for Frank Williams, but again only as test driver. Alex Wurz came to us late in the day, surprisingly, not being used again by McLaren and their loss. It most definitely we feel our big gain. Um, he's experienced, he's quite charming, very clever and um, prepared to work extremely hard. It's all a personal get in the car at 9 o'clock in the morning if necessary, get out for a sandwich at lunchtime, get back in again and stay there for another four hours. And that's serious hard work and that makes a big difference to a Grand Prix team. Qualities that have ultimately convinced his boss. In 2007, Alexander Wurz will be one of Williams' main drivers. It's the long-awaited second chance, which he aims not to let slip.
What I want, of course, is to be in a good team where you've got a long-term goal and are potentially also capable of winning. So I'm giving it all I've got. With Mark Webber leaving, Williams hope that Alexander Wurtz will drive them back to the front. Then, the eternal third man can finally prove again that he's one of the best in the Grand Prix Spotlight too. Coming up in Safety Focus, Runoff Zones. And now in Techno, Telemetry. Every lap, every kilometer and every test takes a Formula One team that bit further along the road to success. Collecting and analyzing key measurements, gaining important data and information, getting feedback from drivers after their stint on the track. When you come in with the car, there's obviously not much time. You have to be very precise, get straight to the point and describe the car's main problems so the engineer can quickly make a couple of alterations that could then maybe make the car much faster. It all has to happen very fast and be very precise. These days, fast and precise information is also transmitted from the cars on the track to the engineers at the control center and in the pits. The thoughts of a Formula One car, relayed not by telepathy, but by telemetry. Diagrams and rows of figures that reach the engineer's computers by wireless transmission. Up to four megabytes a lap, around 3,000 type sheets of data, plus another 40 megabytes whenever the car's back in the pits. The data are primarily recorded so that everything can be analyzed. That means everything that moves, because of pressure or is liquid, everything that's recorded and then worked on later, especially things to do with aerodynamics, the tires and tire temperature. Actually, everything that happens in the car can be recorded. After the recording comes the evaluation. Data are analyzed, numbers compared and discussed. After a training lap, the team therefore knows how they can get even more out of the car, how they can improve the setup, and so the performance on the track. Lap by lap, perfection gets even closer. Even during the race, Formula One cars are transmitting data to the pits. Over 100 sensors are fitted on board, measuring and relaying all the important information. So the crew, for example, can quickly find out if anything's wrong on the car. From fuel consumption to oil pressure, the engineers are kept constantly informed and so can act quickly if need be. Telemetry. It's now impossible to imagine Formula One without it. Years ago, many still mocked the idea. Transmitting and recording data was first developed way back in the early 80s. It was initially vehicle readings that were transmitted to the pits. Fuel and oil pressure, the engine temperature and rev count. Being able to record data has fundamentally changed Formula One. Naturally, and thank God, you still need a driver to drive the car who's as talented as possible. But getting to these lap times, to this level of perfection that the cars now represent, we've only achieved that thanks to the recording of data. How does the car react at a certain speed? Can the engine withstand higher revs? Can you brake even later in this corner? Questions that telemetry can answer. Driving, however, is still a job for the driver. For even with the most modern high-tech in the vehicle, it's still a human being in the cockpit who has to control and master the car. Time for a short break, but we'll be right back with our news and facts. In Safety Focus, safety beside the track, runoff zones. Don't go away. Welcome back to Inside Grand Prix. Coming up, news and facts. But first, in Safety Focus, runoff zones. Always at the limit, constantly on the edge. On the track, the drivers fight out exciting duels and make thrilling maneuvers. The necessary safety is guaranteed at the track perimeter. If the cars stray offline, crash barriers, tire stacks and runoff zones act as reliable emergency brakes. 
Es gibt ja zwei verschiedene Arten. There are two types of race circuit, those with runoff zones and those without. On the ones without, like Monaco, the choice is between crash barriers and tire stacks if anything goes wrong. If you have a problem, you simply crash into them. Tire stacks are also used here and there on proper racetracks, but in front of them you have runoff zones. Under or oversteer, overtaking mishaps or technical defects, the job is to catch any involuntary departures from the track. And the drivers know that if things get hairy, the open protective areas will rescue them. It's certainly the case that if you've got a corner with a 20-meter runoff zone followed by a wall, you take it a bit more cautiously than a corner that's followed by a more open space. Because then you know, okay, you can go over the limit without anything happening. You can really test out where the limit actually is. The most traditional type of runoff zone is the gravel trap. 25 centimeters deep filled with gravel intended to create the maximum possible friction and resistance, so slowing the car down. One drawback, anyone who gets stuck in here seldom gets back out. Used more and more often over recent years, runoff zones made of rough asphalt. Compared to sandy loose gravel traps, asphalt has the advantage that cars leaving the track maintain their grip on the ground kinder alternative for cars and drivers alike. Sand will stop you quicker, but sand can also make the car pitch, you can make the car lift. Asphalt, uh, if big enough and with a great enough area, can also stop the car. It depends on the circuit and the corners and how the whole thing's set up. Formula One drivers concentrate on the perfect line. In the heat of the battle, no one gives a thought to potentially leaving the track. The asphalt zones have some very positive features. If a car leaves the track, the grip of the zone surface enables the driver to get the car back under control. No bouncing, no rolling over. To many, however, they're not totally fair. If you uh, make an error in a race that uh, you shouldn't really be uh, you know, be able to drive off and come back on and, and not really lose a position or lose much time. Uh, but of course then on the safety side of things, if you have a real technical problem or a brake failure or wing failure, uh, there is certain uh, runoff areas which are safer uh, to arrest the car from hitting the tyre barrier faster. So, and that means asphalt runoffs are probably uh, safer in that respect. But uh, my first point on an asphalt runoff, if a driver makes an error, he can come back on and uh, not be punished for his mistake, which sometimes is a bit frustrating. The protective aspect is of prime concern. Formula One plays it safe in a variety of ways. In combination with runoff zones, tire stacks absorb the remaining force of any impact. Crash barriers are used where cars are likely to hit at a narrow angle. Posts anchored deep into the ground and multiple rows one above the other provide the necessary stability. Rigid walls, used for protection where space is very limited, such as in front of grandstands. The car is thrown back onto the track at the same angle. The only walls to provide a cushioning effect, however, are soft walls, where special foam and crash barriers are placed at the front. Saving the day if you lose control. I was in a really fast right-hander where it was pretty tight, a wall and gravel trap on the left and hard up to a wall on the right and my left rear tire suddenly blew. The car goes totally out of control. You just spin around, pull in your arms and hope, please don't hit anything. Motor racing at the edge, but the drivers in the cockpit know. At the track side, they're protected by the best safety precautions possible. Now we continue with our series Formula One 30 years ago. The Austrian Grand Prix was the first race after the catastrophe at the Nürburgring. As Niki Lauda was still fighting for his life, Ferrari decided not to enter. The others tried as best they could to put the scenes from that race behind them. Yeah. 
Zeltweg was the farewell Grand Prix for Lana Lombardi. While Hans Joachim Stuck was preparing for his 30th Formula One race. And James Hunt was again the fastest in qualifying. There was a new face on the front row, John Watson in the Penske. The early moments in Zeltweg in 1976 were again tricky. The main straight sloped downhill and it had rained just before the start. A deft touch was needed on the throttle. Hunt and Watson accelerate away together, both just waiting for the other to ease up and drop back. The beneficiary is Roddy Peterson, who passes Hunt on the brakes. It was all John Watson could do to keep pace with Peterson, who was driving like a man set free. The drivers tried every trick in the book, and not the ideal line, but the battle line came up trumps. The Austrian Grand Prix developed into the most fluctuating race of the season. At times, up to six drivers were all jostling each other. Positions were changing by the second. First, Ronnie Peterson would have his nose in front, then John Watson again. The high-speed Austrian circuit with its long straights and flat-out bends invited slipstream games and overtaking maneuvers. Race order on the 20th lap, Ronnie Peterson ahead of John Watson, then Jody Schachter and Gunnar Nilsson. But only for a moment. Within seconds, whoever was race leader would soon find himself three places down again. And so it went, lap after lap, every driver at full stretch needing eyes in the back of his head. After lap 25, Jody Schechter became a spectator. Then on lap 46, the decisive overtaking maneuver. John Watson is finally able to force his way past Ronnie Peterson and take the lead. Back in the pack, Emerson Fittipaldi and Vittorio Brambilla collide. A misunderstanding about right away ends their day's work at Zelfeg but their mutual respect remains intact. Just before the end, Jacques Lafitte secures second place for himself as he gets past Gunnar Nilsson. In what was to be the fastest race of the year, John Watson gives Penske the first ever Formula One victory for an American design. At the final flag, Jacques Lafitte was just 10 seconds away from the big breakthrough. For James Hunt, fourth place was enough to move up behind Nicky Lauder in the standings. At Zeltweg, John Watson fulfilled his great dream of winning a Formula One Grand Prix. And what could be better after that than to soak up the applause in style? Time for our news and facts. Who, where, why and with whom? It's one question after another and now finally some answers. So Alexander Wurtz is joining Williams. Nico Rosberg is already placed, so Mark Webb is going to Red Bull. David Coulthard's already placed, so Christian Klein is going maybe to Midland. It's certain that Jack Villeneuve is leaving BMW, but who's coming, no one knows. So that leaves the crucial Ferrari question. If Schumacher goes and Kimi comes, Massa will stay. If Schumacher stays and Kimi comes, Massa will go. But what if Kimi stays at McLaren and drives with Alonso and Schumacher still decides to retire? It's one question after another. The much-publicized challenge between the races in the air and on the ground attracted huge numbers of spectators. Two races on the ground and one in the air. One lap around the Hero Square in Budapest. The result was not important. The main thing was the spectacle. The result? Donuts on the tarmac and loops in the sky and well-earned mutual respect for the competitors. The hardest braking point in the Turkish Grand Prix also demands respect. It lurks at turn 5. The engineers from Brembo have calculated that the drivers reach the corner at about 310 km an hour. They break down to 105 in 3.8 seconds over a distance of just 160 meters. That puts a huge strain on the driver. He has to withstand up to 5G. That was Inside Grand Prix. We'll see you again for the next Grand Prix in Italy.